You're listening to Science and Saucery, a show dedicated to adding life to your years. And now your hosts, registered dietitian Juliana Hever and scientist Ray Cronus. Welcome. Hello, hello. We're here again. Yes, I'm we are. I'm very excited about our guest today. Our celebrity star, yes. amazing success John story. Henny is here with us today. John was a client two years ago, 140 pounds. Just rocked it. And two years later, he still has that weight off. And so we're going to talk to him today about his transformation and how he's managed to keep it off. How have you been? I've been great. Thank you. Are you excited? Of course I am. This is this is the one that we, we like to tell people about because he's so inspiring and it's a great story. He's, you know, he's a light. So we have John Henney. John, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us, John. We're so excited. Very happy to be here. So John, it's been amazing getting to know you. And likewise, so many people ask about you. I put your picture all over the place <laughs> and hold you up as that person that did exactly what you were supposed to do, lost the weight exactly as we said you would lose it, and then you stuck to the diet and magically didn't gain it back. No. But, but that's not your real claim to fame. Tell us a little bit about your background outside of this and sort of the strange connections of how you became our client and then let's talk about some of the struggles people probably have getting started the first of this year and what kinds of things we can do to keep them on track. Yeah, so when I'm uh, not eating plants, I <laughs> am a voice teacher. And uh, uh, one of the things I primarily do is I, I train other voice teachers in um, contemporary singing technique and then I do online courses and master classes. And I also happen to be a uh, big fan of uh, Penn and Teller. And one day, a few years ago, I was extremely overweight. Um, and I, Penn was always kind of my excuse because he was another big guy because I'm, I'm six foot seven like Penn is. And I turned on CNN one day and saw Penn on a panel and he had shrunk. And I thought... <laughs> Well, my excuse is gone, number one. And number two, what the hell did this guy do? And I jumped online and quickly found your name. And I messaged you on Facebook and you were kind enough to respond back. And that was the, the start of my strange journey. It was great. It was great. And I, I, I remember to, to fast forward to the end of your journey you messaging one day saying that uh, Dr. Drew had said, hey, did, did you see John Henney lately? He's he's evaporated into skinny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like the best quote I've ever heard, you know? So yeah. many people, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as we talk and unpack your journey, but so many people have negative comments, and I think that's surprising to a lot of people that start where you did. So where, where did you start? What was your starting weight? Well, I don't really know what my starting weight was, or I, I correct that. Uh, I don't know what my highest weight was. The The heaviest I ever weighed myself with was 370. And then I was afraid to get on the scale. And right. then I, I was kind of behaving myself a bit. And when I stepped on at the beginning of this journey, I think I was 364. Right. I was just yeah. looking. I was looking up as we we're as we we're speaking because I get John's weight still every single yeah, day. Yeah, I had started a little bit before I got the 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 scale that tattletales on me. <laughs> right, <laughs> it is. It's like we're watching you. And, and you know yes. that that unyielding accountability really makes a big difference. Really makes a big difference. So my, oh yeah, Big Brother works. Yeah, yeah. So my first number with you was three fifty nine point seven. Yeah. And then you have the perfect was, epitome of the ski slope that we love to look at, like the graph of you just perfectly going down at the exactly predicted rate and maintaining it. It has such a beautiful curve on the app. We love to look at that. 
it it dropped so fast. At first, it didn't seem like it was fast enough, and and then it dropped so fast it was almost disorienting. Right. And so let's put this in perspective for people listening. So he started on April 17th at 359.7. And by December 8th or so, he was at what he weighs today around around 220. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I got below that, but I, right. I put a little back on on purpose. So that's a, around 140 pounds from April 17th until December 12th. He didn't fast. He never, there was never really a day that he wasn't going without food. We just ate and we, we don't, we're not going into details because the idea here is not to just focus on diet, but really to focus on the mindset. And when John reached out, like a lot of people out there have reached out, we always try to give people advice about just switching to a whole food plant-based diet, picking a three to six month period and saying, no matter what, I'm going to stick to this eating this way so that that new normal sets in. And when we have clients that have more than 100 pounds to lose, what we often do is we talk to them because we really want the mindset. And we talk to them and say, you know, would you prefer that you start out with our sort of extreme, and I would say extreme, it's, social, it's, it's biologically normal, but it's socially extreme. So, but our unyielding accountability in the beginning and then keep going or would you prefer that I give you or we give you some things in the beginning to get started and get down to within that 50 to 70 pound final push and get us there? And and John elected the latter. He said, hey, I'll, I'm going to get going here and I'm really going to do what you're telling me to do. And And that makes a big difference because if you're not willing to do it then, you're probably not willing to do it when things get tough. So, and and we'll talk, for example, a, a trip that John went on. I'll let him tell a little bit about that. But John did that, and I watched his weight going down, going down. We we messaged back and forth on Facebook Messenger and other things to encourage him some. But he got down there, and then right on schedule, he hit the weight that we had predetermined. He said, "Okay, Ray, I'm I'm ready for the cult. You know, I'm ready to start." It, and that's pretty much how it happened, right, John? Yeah, it is, and I was. <laughs> I was uh, somewhat disappointed that I had to start again with the potato restriction, as you say. So, John, so that's like the key point. And before we go through the entire journey, you were ready. And besides Penn being a role model, like what was your mindset? What Had you had any difficulties with having the excess weight? Had it taken a long time to build up the excess weight? What was your, what was your mindset? How did you feel? What made you ready to do anything to accomplish this amazing goal? I... Uh, being in my fifties, I just started to see the first glimmer of declining health. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm six foot seven, I'm a large frame. So I wasn't dealing with pain in my knees or my back, but my blood pressure was starting to be an issue and they wanted to put me on meds. And that's when I just stopped and said, I, I am not starting this. Because one med leads to another, leads to another. Right. And I realized this is just insanity. And, uh, you know, and, and without going further into it, just just the way that Ray, Urine Ray's program is structured, because it, it just set me up to reframe everything and to, to take me the rest of the way into this, this completely different lifestyle. Were you surprised at how many cues to eat and how your life was wrapped around food before in, and you weren't even aware of it? Was that, was that a surprise to you? Yeah, I would, I would find myself driving down the street and, and just being overwhelmed by how much I was being inundated with sugar, salt, and fat everywhere I looked. Right. Right. And it's, it's just constant. And you start to be aware of just how much time you spend eating and mindlessly eating and, and just eating things that you maybe enjoy for the first couple of bites. And then it's just this robotic idea of just shoving as much in as you can. Right. Yeah, I had that too. You know, I always say I love to eat, but eating's over when you swallow and it's time for another bite. And that's kind of the downside to it. Yeah. And, and, and just, you know, eating to where you're sick, like, you know, and I, as a 
voice teacher, I knew better, but eating late and having reflux and it affecting my voice and just all of these consequences that I was building up in my body that I was ignoring. It was, it's crazy to look back on it now. And so you began the journey and you started to notice all of this, all of the cues, all of the social, very interesting commentary. And then what was it like to keep going and to persist, even though, you know, it gets exhausting or it gets a little bit like you just want to give in sometimes, you know, that's it's really hard for a lot of people to stick it out. That's why the weight loss industry is so notoriously unsuccessful because people just are done. The difference, because I, I obviously tried a number of times. And I even did the uh, potato restriction without knowing what I was doing. And so beat myself up for two weeks and then went back to eating like I did. Mm -hmm. um, but this time, it was, it was just a realization that I could no longer do moderation. Um, and even a little bit of these foods was just going to pull me right back in. So... I inundated myself with um, plant-based propaganda, <laughs> even realizing I didn't care if it was biased or not. I just wanted to just be in this mindset and just really do this to, and see if it worked for me. So uh, I really didn't give myself a chance to fail. That's amazing. So were you like watching documentaries and reading books or what do you mean? Constantly. By, yeah, <laughs> it's good. Constantly. I, I, I would re-listen to Ray on the Rich Roll podcast or or different things. And, and um, you know, I had this little motto I would constantly say to myself, which was today means nothing. Today means everything. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's beautiful. I like it. Yeah. And the other concept that I think a lot of people don't quite recognize is something Michael Godot said to me for the first time when he was losing weight, which is we lose or we gain in this bite. To create the visceral reality that right now in this moment is always when it happens. And yet our minds always want to look to the future about what we're going to start next Monday or the first of the year or whenever. They always want to look back and say, well, you know, it was this event or it was that event or I had no choice, etc. But the truth of the matter is it always happens in this bite. And we have a very strange way of thinking that pushes away the focus of in this bite. And that's something I think we do when we're coaching people we're always making jokes about things, and we keep in this bite in the forefront. And one of the things I, I do remember is in the midst of this is uh, John had a contract. He talked about the fact that he was a, a vocal teacher teacher, <laughs> and that that's like pizza pizza, right? <laughs> and, and he was a vocal teacher teacher, and he had a trip to Japan. And I'll never forget this text because he said, I'm going to stick to the program and I'm going to Japan and I want you to help me do that. And I'll, I'll never forget his text before he took off because he said, Ray, this is the first time in my life that I could ever put a seat tray table down and I'm comfortable. Yeah. And that wasn't first class. <laughs> Am I telling the story correctly? You are. And it almost brought me to tears because I can only imagine so many people are dealing with that and that lean you is always inside there right you know we always affectionately talk about our fat suit the the lean person inside ourselves the accumulation of calories that's outside but tell a little bit how that experience was well there's there's nothing that reminds you how overweight you are quite like flying from getting yourself through the airport through security trying to put your shoes back on <laughs> after mm. going through security checks to then the dreaded um, folding yourself into the seat. And I used to always panic um, if I could get the seat belt fastened because I didn't want the embarrassment of having to ask for an extender. Oh, wow. And so I would just suck in and push. And I remember one mm. time struggling so hard with my seat belt that I'm uh, in my seat kind of gasping and sweating and thinking, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. 
And in that wow. moment going, I don't think that food was worth this moment. And mm. cut to when I lost the weight and I'm going to Japan. And I mean, I'm just zipping through the airport, just walking so fast. Um, and everything was comfortable. Everything was easy. And to just sit in a seat and it was, I, I could, even at six foot seven, I could fit. Not right. comfortably, right? I still have my knees, but uh, but I could put tray <laughs> tables down. And, and I didn't see when I was, you know, maybe getting on Southwest, obviously didn't go to Japan, but you know, that where you have to pick your seat. When I was 370 pounds, just seeing people's eyes looking at me like, please don't sit next to me. Right. Mm. You know, so it's it was it was completely different and completely liberating. All of those decisions, like like you said, you know, everything is in that moment, that one decision. And then it's so motivating, like it keeps this consistent reminder of why this is so worth it. And, you know, it's like this this series of saying no to things for temporary pleasure. Right. Which is kind of what happens mm -hmm. throughout the day where there's constant invitations to eat this and eat that, especially, you know during the holidays and there's always something going on where there's these constant requests and you're constantly bombarded with these temptations and having those moments where you had, that's, that sounds so profound. And I remember when Ray read me the text and he was so excited. Um, and then you were so successful on your trip, which is hard to do when you're traveling, especially internationally and especially somewhere where they have amazing food like Japan, <laughs> you know, it, it was like reaffirming that all of these decisions were a hundred percent worth it. Absolutely. Part of our survival and looking at being overweight, and I think the medical community, unfortunately, has s sufficiently convinced people that this is a, a, a detrimental biological process, that people are broken, and that somehow their body isn't reacting in the right way. And the way we look at it is that it's really a perfectly normal biological adaptation. You know, if you if you evolved in a calorie scarce world, appetite is a really great feature. But when we put the numbers on it, especially like in your case, you had a, you know, let's just take the 139 pounds and multiplying that out when we look at this and, and we think about the fact that that's 486,500 calories of excess energy. And it's really hard when you're sitting at that point to think about, I mean, at 3000 calories a day, that's 162 days worth of energy. And 3000 is roughly where your resting basal metabolism rate was at your upper end. Of course, it changes as you go down with mass, but when it's outside of about a, you know, what we call a metabolic season, about 12 weeks, when it's outside of that time frame, it can be really discouraging because there's always going to be a celebratory, artificial eating emergency. And so you have to stick with it. And this trip came up. And I also remember when you came back, how excited we both were that you lost like three to five pounds. So you, you were gone like 10 days, right? Yeah. But you still managed to lose. And yes, interestingly, weren't you also getting some negative comments in Japan with from tiny people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. Um, well, changing this way of eating, it, it just, it freaks people out. And they, they were actually concerned for me that I wasn't eating enough hot food. Oh, that's right. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't remember this now. Yeah. Tell yeah, that story. Sarah. Yeah. This is good. Well, because, you know, I was eating uh, a lot of salads and vegetables and things like that, and, and they were concerned it was very unhealthy. Um, <laughs> I wasn't eating enough hot food. Uh, I wasn't eating enough food. Um, you've lost too much weight. I mean, it, when you lose weight quickly, it freaks people out. Had they met you before? Yes. Oh, uh, that's why. That's it. Because yeah. if you had met people for the first time, they wouldn't have thought any different. It would have just been normal. The right. Way, yeah. So there are people now that you meet in your business, et cetera, that never really knew you were overweight and they don't think anything of it. Right. They, they have no idea. Okay. That makes sense. And that's why, that is why we encourage our clients and everyone that's trying to make these transformations to eating a plant-based diet or just to get healthier, to not discuss it. Because we always say everyone eats 
So everyone has an opinion about food and nutrition and everyone thinks they're an expert. And it's when you are there just being you and doing your thing, everyone seems to want to have a comment and think that it's socially acceptable. And it is pretty much socially acceptable to make comments on people's food choices, their weight, especially when it's going down. Right. People don't usually tell you, oh, wow, you've been putting on some weight. Like nobody ever says that. That would be yeah. that would be rude. No. <laughs> you, you should no. lay off the lattes. Your face is I don't know really why you always say fat. lattes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, lattes because I just say it because it's this big sugar fat bomb that we all <laughs> people have. And whether it's soy or not, it's just this in completely mindless, expensive drink, you know, that we've all created as a decadence. Well, so is the handful of M&Ms on the desk. So is the extra dessert at the end of the meal, the but, appetizers. But you don't the- meet people for M&Ms. You meet people for coffee. And so in a social setting, it's like, let's go have a coffee or let's meet at Starbucks and let's get this decadent drink. And if you're overweight, no one's going to say, you know, your face is looking fat. Right. You know, I'm really getting concerned about you. You might have a heart attack. Do you really need to get that latte? But... If you've been overweight and you become lean, everybody will comment about you looking gaunt or thin Mm -hmm. or skinny or sick or a cancer patient. They say really incredibly insensitive things. Yes. It's acceptable to critique somebody for that. And particularly if you did it with a plant-based diet. Yes. Everyone's concerned about your protein and your muscles and oh, it's, uh, the things we hear and it's incessant. And this is 15 years. It just it hasn't gotten any better. People are still saying the same questions and having the same concerns. And John, are you protein deficient? <laughs> Not that I know of, but I get <laughs> but I get asked quite often. Yeah. So here's an interesting question that we've really never talked about. But what about... Since, you know, the fat folds, the skin folds, and all of those things have so much to do with one's voice, what did you notice about your voice and going from being, because I'm sure there's a lot of entertainers, particularly you think about, for example, opera singers and other people where a significant change in weight has to have something to do with all that. What Tell us a little bit about that, the science of, of singing and weight and what you might have learned through this journey. Well, you know, inter- interestingly enough, I've I've spoken to some ear, nose, and throat doctors, and um, no one's really looked into this. Uh, but obviously, y- you know, the the vocal folds, it's essentially ligament, muscle, and then it's it's like a gelatinous uh, material uh, that vibrates. And then epithelium cells over the the top, and this mass. I think when you lose weight, there there has to be some reduction in it. And and one ear, nose, and throat doctor I spoke to said that they sometimes see that in bariatric surgery patients, where you do get some some vocal weakness from losing the weight. And I did experience because I had so much weight to lose. And uh, I did experience some vocal weakness um, coming out of all of it. So that I think that that's really the only downside that I experienced on a on a temporary basis. So it reco- you recovered from that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's I I would say I mean I'm still uh, working on on building up my voice, and I I frankly been so busy. Um, teaching and doing all uh, the things that I do that um, I often don't spend as much time on myself as I should, but I'm, I'd say my voice is about 90% back. Wow. For people interested in this and also, John, I don't know that we've ever talked about it. My friend Nate Ball is a an engineer, uh, really amazing guy, but he spoke at TEDMED 2011 and he's a beatboxer. He's an engineer and a beatboxer. And so they shoved a camera down his nose on oh. stage Mm. And he beatboxed with the camera on his vocal cords. Whoa. It's surprising we don't know more about this. And I think there is an interest there. And I I imagine that there probably is someone out there that worries about it. And what you're saying is there's actually at least something they have to consider. Yes. Yeah. If I mean, if you are an overweight professional singer and you want to get healthy, um, you might want to do it a bit more slowly um, 
in that case, I'm not entirely sure, but just based on my own experience, although for myself, I needed to do this quickly because it was yeah. really just becoming a, a health issue. I can understand that, but my guess is is that there probably is a good balance that one could strike between mm -hmm. what their performance is like, lugging themselves around and not being as physical, especially if you're performing on these grueling tours and you're you're doing that, but it just seems like that just getting it done, I, I really, when I see people slow down, again, if you think about that disposing of 468,000 calories, that's a lot of calories that have to go by, you know, that's 3,000 calories a day of extra calories for 160 days, and, and people just don't realize how efficient we are because we're these mobile, we used to call them at NASA, self-loading carbon payloads. <laughs> <laughs> so because we're, we're mobile, it's really critical that we store our energy in very dense forms so that we can stay mobile. And fortunately, there's a backside of that is that we have this unnatural access to calorie content, which means we can sequester a lot more energy than probably could ever be done in nature. I think it's really shocking for a lot of people and even to see it as a dietitian and for us watching our clients the difference between what it takes to lose weight and what it takes to maintain that weight loss and i'd love to hear about your experience john because it's been a while now but you could get a lot away with a lot more <laughs> after the fact like weight loss is a special period of time and we call it weight loss w-a-i-t because you're waiting to go through it for your body to go through and metabolize those calories until you're, you know, using up your stored energy organ. And, but once you get to that point and, and which is what was so great about you is that you just did it and got it done. And then you get to eat, you know, evolve into like a regular way of living where you're implementing some strategies, but it's much more feasible and not intimidating as the weight loss process. So there's a, there's a giant difference between weight loss and weight loss maintenance. And so what was your transition like? Well, the thing that I'm very thankful for is Ray had me get below um, where I ultimately wanted to be. Because as soon as I began to normalize my eating in the new way, the, the body's going through changes and there was some rapid weight gain that kind of freaked me out but since I was below where I needed to be, it didn't become a crisis. And I didn't start thinking, oh, my diet's ruined. And then that kind of tapered off and I, I kind of found my, um, my rhythm. Um, but what really surprised me is I kept looking forward to being able to have a rare and appropriate cheat day. All the foods that I'd said goodbye to, I thought, yeah, but once I lose this, I can, I can have them again. And Ray had said, you know, what makes you happy can change. And I thought, oh, well, that's not going to work for me. I'm still going to love these foods. I've had one rare and appropriate day in two years. Wow. And that's because my kids wanted to take me out to sushi. Bravo. And, and, and I'm impressive. just not interested. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. And to put this in perspective, back to this weight loss and gain, John's only varied about 10 pounds up and down Which in is two years. completely normal. That is yeah. completely normal for any weight. You, most yeah, people that, that's vacillate. That's a 5% change yes. for him at, at you know roughly at two, 200 pounds. So you are the epitome of if you get down to that weight loss and what Julian was saying, if you get down to that ideal weight, losing weight and not gaining it are two totally different things. And it doesn't matter how much you know. For me, it's the same kind of thing. I, I have to push really hard because when I did my original weight loss, I stopped early, not because I didn't know. I didn't know what I was supposed to weigh at that point. I really didn't. And I was, you know, it was wrapped up in the diabetes and lots of other things, but I maintained that weight for, I don't know, three to five years before I started doing more experiments, metabolic and losing. And exactly what you're saying, John, when I would, when I would just try to adjust my weight by 15 pounds, it would just creep right back up to that new normal weight. And for me to make the change that you made, and you know, we did this with Juliana th you know, three years ago, it, would, it requires me to do the same thing. I need to get down to that new weight, you know, shift it by 15 pounds and hold it for, I don't know, probably 18 to 24 months. And that's just a guess. I can't say that there's really hard science with that. 
but hold it. And then you find it gets easier and easier, right? Like right now, you don't actively manage your diet. You're just eating. Is is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've, if it starts to creep up like a little bit, I'll, I'll back off the grains. I'll move towards the, the top of the triangle, if you will. Um, oh, we will. we will. We love we that. <laughs> <laughs> Talk triangle, John. Talk triangle. <laughs> Yeah, and so I can just I can just adjust, move up and down, um, y- you know, some l- less nuts, um, less grains, more greens, and then the weight just drops. I mean, it's I'm completely in control of it. Yes, That's great. And you have this hard number, right? Like you have this cutoff. Like, no, I will not get above this point. I'm I know when it's time to rein it in because you've kind of established that boundary for yourself. Is that right? Exactly. And the change, it's not that big of a change. Right. It's not like before where I'd have to give up all these things I, I love. It's like, no, I, I have this range of foods that I eat. And I just I just move a little bit to the the less calorically dense part of that range. But it's still all foods that I enjoy. It's not a punishment. Right. That's great. Yes. Have you tried anything out of the, the HealthSpan solution yet? I have indeed. Oh, oh well, so tell, tell us about that experience. Experiment. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I did the um the eggplant rollatini. Mm. Yum. And the uh vegan ricotta uh in there. I had somebody tell me I really couldn't tell the difference between that and ricotta cheese. Yeah. It's very uh, surprising the, to people, isn't it? It is, it is. And then I did the Did you make the sauce as well or did you I did. Oh you did. Oh, what did you I think did. of that? The sauce is fantastic. Yeah, my, my grandmother, oh. I wish my grandmother were alive to try yeah. that. So, Oh, she, that sauce is so good. She, she tossed meatballs and pig's feet and all kinds of other <laughs> stuff on hers, you know. But, but what we did is we took the spice set from Italian sausage and just bumped it up a little bit. So it kind of has that background fennel, spicy kind of thing. My grandmother liked things spicy. She put the red crushed peppers on My kind of lady. Yeah, yep, she did. Yep. So, all right. So you you made that. That's great. What else? I made the uh, the spicy chickpeas. What do they call? The... Oh, yes, the Indi- the masala. Right? It's a masala. Yes. Oh, yeah. no, it's not masala. Are... Yeah, it's masala. Yeah, it is. Yep, yeah, it is. Yep, yep. Those are fantastic. <laughs> that was that was like we were so. I was always so intimidated. I love Indian food so much, but I was always intimidated because my Indian friends like, oh yeah, you just go to the spice store and you get like, I don't know, she would name off like hundreds of different. <laughs> And spices. And so I was so nervous, but I really wanted one of these in the mm-hmm. book. And so I'm glad you liked it. That's great. Yeah, it's great. So I've made both of those so far and um, they're a hit. It's been great. Yeah. Penn's been sending pictures <laughs> uh, almost a daily basis or at least every other day. Emily is uh, has been fixing, making, fixing things out of the book. <laughs> It's I'll so cute though. He sends right. he sends a picture. Just say fixing. It's just yeah. great. He sent Penn sends these pictures of him with the cookbook picture and then him eating the actual meal. And it's great. I it's love really it. It's really great. So he's he's had some stuff. Well, maybe I'll get it. Maybe I can talk him into posting some of them. But it's yeah. just been it's been so much fun with all of you guys that came along this journey with us. You know, we we were all texting along the way and messaging, and it's really been fun to have it out there in reality. And now imagine you were going through the transformation and you were able to flip through this the entire time. And and when you started your new journey, being able to just open this up and you know, a lot of the information that we talk about during the, along the way is there for you to, to dig in. And, and then you have recipes to start the, the new normal. Well, the, I'll tell you what also makes it handy is I, I get people peppering me how to do this, how yeah. to do this. And and I've actually bought extra copies of the book to just give to people. Well, thank you. Aw. Thank you. Thank you. So, John, that said, what would you say? Because I think it's it doesn't matter how you do it. It's the mindset. And that's what you... That's why you're our star. You know, we love to talk about you and you inspire so many people, just your story. And it's all about where your mind was and how you persisted and you, you achieved and you are still there and it's, you've shifted your relationship with food. So instead of the, how exactly the details, it's really, what advice would you give to those that have this looming, really intimidating amount of weight to lose and just wanting to shift their diet? Like what, what do you think would be your top tips on 
getting ready and handling it and, and kind of preparing mentally and emotionally for this journey? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. It's it's a tough one to answer because it's different for everybody. So I can, uh, but for me, the, the first thing was just forgiving yourself. Um, I remember Ray told me, you're not broken. And I was able to like let go of all the, the self, I don't know if I want to say hatred, but the, but the anger that I'd put myself in that position. And I felt it was just because the, there must be something wrong with me. I'm just, I'm so lazy or I have no discipline. And it's like, no, we're, we're actually, as Ray said, we're biologically driven to, to eat and to store calories. And now we have this food that didn't really exist like this when I was a child. And certainly not uh, this inexpensively and conveniently. So you, you have to forgive yourself. You have to really commit. And, and when the day is tough, I just kept going back to today means nothing. Today means everything. Because it, I can get through this day. I can deal with it. But so in that sense, it means nothing. But I know if I fail today, that's everything because then it's much more likely that I'm going to fail tomorrow. And you have to know that your tastes will change. I wouldn't have thought it. I mean, I put salt on everything. I would, <laughs> I had a, a meat smoker. I would smoke meats and cook elaborate meals. And I'd, in the evening, I'd have a martini or two. And then the game was, what in the fridge can I put mayonnaise on? <laughs> you know, I mean, this food was my Disneyland. And I, mm. I thought that I was, I was giving up happiness for the rest of my life, that now I just have to suffer because of my food sins. And at about the five week mark, I actually started to enjoy the food. And at about the five month mark, it became preferable. Right. And you have to give yourself a chance for your taste to change. Right. All food is habit. It, it is. If you travel the world and look at the diverse range of foods that people call decadent, it's not surprising that we can easily change those preferred foods. I mean, we come out of the womb as a neonate, we respond to umami, we respond to sweet. Other than that, we don't respond to bitter, but I love an IPA. We certainly wouldn't respond to bitter and sour. You know, a baby doesn't respond well to sour. Sour is something you acquire a flavor for. And, you know, when you go to, for example, Thailand and you go to the, the convenience store, you just have rows and rows of really stinky, salty, fishy, squid flavored things. And I'm, I'm not saying that in a, in a condescending way. I'm saying like I didn't acquire the flavor, but kids just love that stuff. Our friends that, you know, they don't want to open it in their car because they know it stinks. But at the same time, they're like, oh, my God, it's so good. They love it. You know, you, you just see their whole face lighting up like they just got a package of Skittles. Right. And because mm -hmm. that's the culture they they grew up on. And in South America, you know, I had friends that were, really loved those grubs that they would dig out of the out of the wood at a certain time of the year. They go out into the forest and in South America and they would dig these grubs out and they just put the whole wiggling grub in their <gasps> mouth. You can g Google this. I don't know this. about this. And, and they don't eat the little head, but they <sighs> you know, the whole thing and they like the way they squirt. And I'm, I'm oh. thinking, you know, this is our freshen up gum. <laughs> you know, back in, you know, if anybody's old enough to remember that. I love that. freshen up gum. Yeah. So, and so the fact that we respond this way is it's just habit. It's just habit. I grew up in Maryland. We ate steamed crabs. Steamed crabs look disgusting. So does shrimp. But you acquire a flavor and then once you get used to, and for those people out there that have had them, you know, the yellow fat that's in the, the corner of the crab. Or if you're in, uh, let's go down to crawfish land down in Louisiana, it's the, you know, suck the head and eat the tail, right? So, you know, the, all of that innard stuff that you eat out of there. So and my point here is, is that this is true. That's the real world and your lens on it is invented. It's habit. It, you know, what you like or dislike could change 
if you're forced into a situation where you must change. And what it sounds like you did, John, is by being so bought into the idea that I'm going to do this and sticking with it day after day after day, these new habits formed. I mean, isn't that really how this happens? Absolutely. And the miserable part in retrospect was was so short, I can barely remem mm -hmm. remember it. When I was in it, it, it was an eternity. Mm -hmm. But once it passes, and it and it does pass, it's it's just amazing. And you're like, wow, I don't need salt on things. I can actually taste the salt, the natural salt within food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of what we eat, most of what people eat, we always say that sauce, you know, most like meat or vegetables are delivery systems for sauce. But if you look at the way we're raising children, you know, I'm a mom, my children are still kind of young. And, you know, everyone around me was feeding their children this beige diet where there's almost no flavor or it's just salt and fat and sweet and, you know, a lot of sugar and flour and just very bland things that we get so used to that actual flavor is so foreign and intimidating to children. And it's it's kind of a backwards way to, to, to raise our children. I think that I wish we could go back to, you know, whole foods starting at the beginning when our taste buds are so new and, you know, ready and, and instead of blunting it. And I've watched this happen and it was really frustrating as a mom and as a dietitian you know, at every sports event and every, you know, practice and every, every day there was some kind of junk food being shoved in my children's faces. And it's just so hard to fight that, you know, and just your home, like when you've got the whole society eating this way and really maligning your taste palate and, and how you're, you know, what you, what you recognize and enjoy. It's, it's really challenging. It's, it's like you wake up from this, this dream when you're, when you're engulfed with all that food and that culture of just eating. And then you step back and you just think, my gosh, what was I doing? Yeah. And what are we, what are we doing to ourselves? I mean, anybody, if you just stop and think of all the beautiful people in your life that you've lost because of food. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really sobering. And, you know, again, that was me. I, I realized, wow, I'm, I'm about to really imperil my health for the joy of being habituated to this food. Yes. And then there's just this normalcy of this is how it is. And so many people, and I'm, I'm blown away still at even the healthcare practitioners, the physicians that are talking to their patients that don't even recognize this very deep connection between food and our health outcomes. And it's, you know, it's become so socially normal to eat junk all the time that we're so far removed. We don't even, so many people don't even recognize that there's a connection and there's just this like, see no evil, hear no evil, you know? It's 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 amazing. It's amazing when you watch people heal with food and you see it and you see it and you see it and you read the research and it's so clear. And yet I think most people maybe don't want to know because that means once you have that information, it's almost like you have to make a choice. Like you're making an, a, a what's it called? A um, educated decision and you ha you're responsible for those choices you make on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, I mean, f for myself and, and now I see other people do it. Even though I knew I was horribly overweight and I shouldn't be eating this, it was always, yeah, but I want to enjoy life. Yes. Right. As if somehow ending my life sooner was worth this moment of this food. That, that, that's how deep the hooks were into me. Yes. Right. And I think a, an important framework to sort of go along with our music discussion today, you know, Penn in his book, Presto, talks about the three chords of rock and roll versus jazz. And and I think that was such a beautiful way to put it because it's okay, look, every now and then if you you want to, you know, there's not there's most people, you know, you hear the first couple of notes of ACDC's Black and Black and you know it. Like you, everybody has got that your head is by, is bobbing <laughs> by the end of whatever. And there's a time and place where that is absolutely great. And this these three chords are the, you know, the sugar, salt and fat. Our bodies respond to that in a really predictable way 
But jazz music doesn't fit all of those neat, easy to understand the timing. Everything about it is different. And for me, until I went to New Orleans the first time and even heard that version live, you know, there, there, was, there was part of it that it was part of the whole, whole overall ambience that made me love it. And the same thing, I don't like country music, but when we go to Nashville, Ugh. I love to go listen to country music. I don't put it on. I gravitate more to raw. But when I'm there and I'm listening to it with the, their faces and their the energy. The bass and the Ugh. energy, and I love it there. So I, I feel like... <laughs> In some sense, a plant-based diet represents the same kind of thing. You know, I, I I still like some of the things that I had before, but like you, my tastes have shifted totally. And you said rare and appropriate earlier when we talked about it, and we don't say cheat days, but we you you get you get a special dispensation because you said the food triangle. So we'll say they <laughs> negate each other. But anyway, in our rare and appropriate, you know, when we do rare and appropriate, it usually isn't the stuff I used to eat. It's it's actually maybe more decadent versions of what we already love. So it would be things like Mexican food. You know, that kind of thing where I know I know that a restaurant yeah. you know, I don't assume that any restaurant is there to do anything other than to entertain you. And they, they pull out the three chords of rock and roll. They don't do it with jazz for the most part. So I, I don't know, just thinking about it that way and putting that framework about what you're saying about your desires changing and that you could really lo- learn to love this other thing. I, I, I think music is a per- perfect example of something that's a ac- acquired taste. Is it not? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I remember... As a kid, back when we used to buy albums and the album was an investment, so you would, you know, listen to the thing the whole way through and there would be songs that I didn't like immediately because maybe they were a little more musically dense. But then as I became habituated to the album, they often became my favorite songs. Yeah. And the ones that I liked instantly didn't stick with me as much. Right. Oh, that brings back so many memories. It, it really does. <laughs> I and, love and that. I lament the fact that album rock and album music is gone. I can take something like Wish You Were Here or even Animals. You know, Animals is so complex, Pink Floyd Animals. And yet- You when just I, listed two of my favorite albums. So. <laughs> that, that they, yeah, so Animals. And what's really amazing about Animals to me is that my mind remembers every little sound my brain still to this day just remembers every little, you know, I mean, it's like you, you know it and it's familiar. Yeah. I, I mean, I could even bring up the exact patterns of the dogs barking. Yes, absolutely. In the song dogs. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can hear it. That is repetition. That's, that's repetition. Mm. I mean, that's where's the beef. That's have it your way. Yep. You know, that that's it works. Our brains love that order and that repetition. And an album is a perfect analogy because we were forced, you know, you put the needle on. It was very difficult to listen to it out of order. You know, you could, you know, get it between tracks, it but you couldn't, you, re- you couldn't re- replay it easily. You listen to them in a linear fashion and that discipline did work, I think, very well with the brain, whereas today... It's so easy to listen to anything on demand that I suspect very few people have heard an album. Are there albums? I guess there are albums. I've, I suspect oh, yeah. very few people but heard. people buy a song now but, yeah. from here and there and pick it out. It's, it's a whole it's, different it's real, world. That's a really good example, John. I, yeah. think, I think that really sort of wraps up, you know, from the perspective of how those habits encroach on us. And it is until the new diet is equally convenient, familiar, and enjoyable to the old diet, you don't have a choice. One or more of those will end up dominating your plate. And I think that is a really important message. Uh, And, you know, I think you bring up, to continue that analogy, there there was a ritual to the album. That, that, you know, you had to, you pulled it out of the sleeve and you mm. set it on the turntable and you cleaned it and you dropped the needle and there was the opening and then the closing of that side. And then you had to repeat the ritual and it was like starting anew. Now it's side two. It's, it's the next act. Right. Until, and 
it's it's much like food. The way we used to be with food is we would we would cook food and we would sit around. You know, we we had a communal gathering place, and it was it there was a ritual to food, and it was special. And and now for a fraction of an hour's wages, even you know, to people who make minimum wage. You can have more than a day's worth of calories just handed through a window to you uh, in your car. Three minutes. In just a matter of minutes. Yeah. There's, it, food is, is no longer special. It's just... It's That's just exactly. easy and yeah. cheap. Exactly. I always say there is no, it's no, there are no treats anymore. You know, they say, no. oh, it's a special treat. It's a special occasion. But exactly like you said, if today is nothing, today is everything. If every meal is a treat, then that completely resolves. If, if every meal is special, no meal is special. Yeah. That's the, yeah. the Incredibles, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And there is totally something to agree. say about the ritual. It's. You know, but you just create new rituals and they become familiar, convenient, enjoyable, and it's the new normal. Yeah, it, it really Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Saved my life. Mm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, John, thank it has you. been great having a conversation. I think we should do this again at some point just because I don't think we've even begun to scratch the the surface of all of your transformation. And, and I love the fact that you were able to do this and maintain and I want to make sure to hold you accountable so that, you know, a year from now, maybe in December, you know, it's, we're just a few days off of your anniversary. You know, it was the December 8th, right? Wasn't that mine was December 8th too. I think Penn started on December 8th. Oh, I think mine was the 10th. The 10th. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, we will, we'll, I think we should definitely, if, if we don't hear from you before, we should check in with you next December as well, because you know, this is two years, and that will be three years, and I think that it, it requires a little bit of direction for that period of time while that new normal sets in, but you've already been just an outstanding success. And very and, and inspirational. And an amazing friend. I, I really enjoy our, our messaging and everything else and, and the people that you've inspired. And if anybody wants to get in touch with John, you can go to johnhenny.com, and that, that's John Henny Vocals if you're into the voice side. He also on his Instagram, he, he has a lot of videos. He does, uh, um, courses, online courses, vocal courses. And John, it was really, really a pleasure to have you here this week. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Bye. I love that. Today is nothing. Today is everything. If every meal's special, no meal's special. Thank you for joining us on this leafy green path to good health. It's always the food. So remember, keep keep eating eating right. Thank you for listening to Science and Saucery. For more details about the content in today's show or to contact Juliana and Ray, please visit us at healthspansolution.com. 